coming up next is Professor of History and Political Science and Black Studies, Joseph Fitzgerald. Joseph Fitzgerald and Dr. Carr were both at Temple University at the same time getting their PhDs in African American Studies. Temple University is the first PhD granting program in African American Studies um, in the country. And so it is well known as being African-centered. Some people may have heard the term Afrocentric, which is short form for centered in African thought. But Afro Afrocentricity is not the opposite of Eurocentricity. Afrocentricity is a response or a reaction to Eurocentricity, but Afrocentricity challenges us to be centered in the truth. The truth as we know it, as anthropologists know, that the beginning of humanity was in Africa. So African-centeredness is really truth-centeredness because for two-thirds of human existence, all human beings were African. Let me say that again. <laughs> for two-thirds of human existence, all human beings were African because human beings had not left the continent yet. So Joseph Fitzgerald is a blessing to our campus. He is the biographer for Gloria Richardson, and I'll have him tell you a little bit more about that. But Gloria Richardson, who is one of our pioneers, who really was a supporter of the liberation of people. He sat with her and spoke to her. What a, what a great honor to have that privilege to speak with one of our ancestors, one of our pioneers. So Joseph Fitzgerald is coming up to talk to us about how enslaved Africans used music and dance for liberation. And he will be followed by Kamal Blackney, Kamal, <laughs> Kamal Blackney, who is going to give us a capoeira performance, and he's actually going to demonstrate for us the ways in which our ancestors used music and dance specifically for our liberation. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. It is an honor to be here. So I want to welcome you all. If I haven't had a chance to welcome you personally, welcome. I've been working at Cabrini since 2014. I love this job. It's excellent. Uh, I, I, as uh, Ms. Layla Dunbar said, I come to you through Black Studies. Black Studies was the thing that actually made me, made it possible for me to become a better human being because I learned how to be a better human being through black studies, through this, the, the courses, through the, the, the various types of interactions I had with people. And black studies is problem driven and solution oriented. And that's all about what I was raised to believe in my family. So thank you for this. And I'm only just going to spend a few minutes speaking with you all on how enslaved Africans use music and dance for liberation. So let's start off with some of the music. We, we started today by listening to the, dr the drum ensemble, which I've always enjoyed. And we've already heard Mr. Perry Brisbane sing a couple of beautiful pieces for us. And later on, we will hear Mr. Owen Valentine demonstrate how enslaved Africans use the fiddle to provide musical accompaniment to dancing. Of course, our first instrument is our voice. Then we began using our hands and our feet to clap and stomp so that we could emphasize a particular part of a song and to keep time. Eventually, people began to create instruments such as the banjo and the drum. And incidentally, the banjo and the drum are African instruments. And other instruments were created, like the fiddle, and these have been a part of the black musical aesthetic for hundreds of years. During the 1800s, black people created spirituals and shared messages of morality to their children, and they emphasized how people could stay in communion with the gods and their, their, their one God. Um, other spirituals 
discuss black people's enslavement and that like the Israelites God would deliver enslaved Africans from the many Babylons here in the Americas the spiritual wade in the water was often used by enslaved people enslaved Africans to pass on the coded message of how they could escape their enslavers spirituals with their messages arrangements and delivery were one of the key foundations of modern gospel music. These and their black secular music genres, such as ragtime, blues, rock and roll, R&B, and rap, you've heard some of this already today. Uh, these include what we would call Africanisms, or specific elements of African aesthetics and sensibilities that keep the performers in dialogue with, the pe with their people's past as well as with the here and now. Collectively, these genres of music convey a variety of black thought, black feelings, and black strategies for survival. And here are just some. Uh, some of these are familiar to you, at least you know, because you've heard them sometime in your life. Uh, there are songs of critique, such as Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit and Gil Scott Heron's The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Uh, there are songs of rage, such as Nina Simone's Mississippi GD and Public Enemies Fight the Power. There are sorrowful songs. The spiritual Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child is an example of a sorrow song. Songs of hope and faith, such as Queen Latifah's UNITY and Kirk Franklin, the gospel singer, his song Revolution. There are love songs. Luther Vandross, we all love Luther Vandross. His song, The Power of Love, John Legend's All of Me, and Beyonce's Formation. Those are other examples of love songs. And there are also black songs about self-love, such as Lizzo's If You Love Me. So another thing to keep in mind is that Lizzo, Beyonce, Whitney Houston, and, and our own local Patti LaBelle, and so many other black artists, they were raised in the church. And you can hear this church influence in their secular music. Black sacred music and black secular music. Together they chronicle the range of human emotions and they tell the history of black people and their hopes and desires. Likewise, dance. Dance is an art form that black people use to express many things and they use it for many purposes. With its roots on the African continent, Black dance's stylistic elements reflect the blending of many, many African cultures. But the question arises is why would there be so much blending of African people's dance styles? It's because of the crime against humanity known as racial enslavement. And it really needs to be understood as a crime against humanity. For greater than 500 years, black people in the Americas have used dance to express joy and exuberance, pain and sorrow, and hope. Additionally, black people have used dance for the purpose of communicating with their family, friends, and their broader community. Africans used and continue to use dance to honor and stay connected to their ancestors and their culture. And these people dance to celebrate the cycle of life, births, rites of passage, marriages, and funerals. We should understand dance and the context in which Africans perform it and pass it down as evidence that these people are actively participating in life. They were living with an intention of surviving and thriving, and black folks still are. Therefore, we should understand black dance as both a resistance to white supremacy and an affirmation of the African worldview. And this is some things you've already heard Ms. Dunbar talk about, this African worldview, and uh, Dr. Carr mentioned it as well. Okay, this worldview shows that people's lives are interconnected and that life in general is divinely ordered and it is cyclical and rhythmic. Besides their dances that affirm black life, black joy, and black love, there are other dances that black people created as a means of surviving and even critiquing white supremacist culture. One of those dances is the cakewalk. Created in the 1800s, this dance was a black critique of white middle class and upper class demeanors and elitist attitudes that white people had of themselves. Another black performance is Capoeira. This too is both a reflection of black artistic expression 
and resistance to their oppressors. Let me quote a brief description of Kopai era. Quote, the basic aesthetic elements of this were a part of the cultural tradition of enslaved Africans from Western and West Central regions of Africa. These elements were recombined and reinterpreted with the diverse enslaved community of Brazil to create a unique means of self-defense, both driven and discussed, disguised as merely a dance by its musical accompaniment. So soon we will watch Master Camus, um, and he's, he and his uh, colleagues will be performing Kobayera. And I've been looking forward to this all week. So with today's theme on black freedom and liberation, let us stay tuned in to the specific purposes of black dance and music. And I thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And we're out of t-shirts, adult sizes, but we still have sizes for children, so stop over at the table. I'll be there all afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>